Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Jans and I'm also known as Job Coach Germany. Welcome back and happy new week. I hope you had a great start into the new week. So we had a couple of days off and a longer weekend because there was a bank holiday yesterday. And yeah, so now we're basically only starting with a Tuesday into this week. And Mojo's here. Hello. So for everybody that just wants to quickly dive in and know what I'm talking about today, we got to the point that we're talking about the final part of this book, Woohoo! Reinventing Organizations by Frederic Laloux. So I told you a lot of things about that, but before we dive into that, I wanted to share something that I just found on LinkedIn that I find really interesting, that is very important for everybody that is in the middle of the application process, because LinkedIn has written a text or a blog post about the hardest skill that we nowadays need when we are going into job interviews. And the hardest skill is called hybrid competence. So let me just share the text with you guys. After more than two years of increased work flexibility, experts have coined a new soft skill they say deserves attention hybrid competence. And um, by the way, this text is written by Alessandra Rima, who is um, an editor at LinkedIn News. So this hybrid competence sounds a little bit like, okay, hybrid system, like working from home as well as from the office, but we will see. It's not a very long text. So if you've managed to successfully juggle several Zoom calls, monitor endless Slack threads, and maintain relationships with your coworkers, these are all considered skills that are worthy of highlighting on a resume and could help you land your next job. That's what uh, Business Insider writes. And experts say showing that you can handle work from home while balancing partial recovery time for yourself can be a source of power since it proves you can multitask and think flexibly. So let me know in the comments, do you have this skill? Can you put this skill on your resume? Do you have hybrid competence? And let me let me um let me know what you think about that competence. Do you think it's a skill that we actually need? I think it's a variation of flexibility. Yeah. So I remember in 2017, um, yeah, just, I don't know why I said that date, but simply <laughs> that's what I just remembered um, that there were a lot of people that were looking for uh, employees that would be able to move from one department to another. That was what the flexibility was about so that you're not just an expert in your field in your department but that you could also um bring um or be of an be an asset to another department and move across departments so that you're not just simply moving vertically in your hierarchy but also horizontally yeah and um that's basically all that was that i remember what flexibility they were looking for but now with the hybrid work system, we also have hybrid competence. So yeah, let me know what you think. And Mojo says, for sure. So for sure we need it. Yeah, I, I agree. I do agree as well. So let's now use this opportunity to dive into the final part of this book. And I have um, talked to you about the evolution of our workplace. So what we have basically come across uh, and developed out of through different stages. And the author has done a lot of research and he has also, um, he has come up with this system where you have different colors. So the black one is just simply the base, but then we moved from red to amber to orange to green and now we are in teal. And basically all of these stages were um, stages that came with breakthroughs, with developments in our society, but especially in our work life, which when we're looking at management styles and how companies are um, yeah, basically managed, guided, um, and so on. And um, so the red phase was called an impulsive way of 
self-managing. The amber one was a conformist way. The orange one was more with regards to achievement. And the green one was a pluralist view. And now we are in the teal evolutionary phase. And in, the, in this final part, it's all about how do we actually get there? So I used uh, previous um, parts. So if you haven't had the chance yet, um, and Bindu is here. Hi, Bindu. Thank you very much for your comment. Great. I, I like that you like that. Um, so if you haven't had the chance to watch the previous videos yet, I highly recommend for you to do that so that you understand what this evolutionary teal worldview is all about. So basically, there were three breakthroughs that I can share with you. So uh, breakthrough number one was self-management. Breakthrough number two was wholeness. And breakthrough number three was evolutionary purpose. So... But now I would like to share with you the final part of the book that talks about how do we get there, yeah? So, um, so hopefully through the previous parts, through the previous uh, videos, you have received some sort of sense about what the TEAL organization looks like. Um, perhaps you have even developed a sense of how you feel if you were to work in a company like that, because I know... From what I've seen, it would be an ideal workplace for me. Now, there are some questions for you in the book already. Um, what does it take for an organization to be teal? What is the role of leadership in such an organization? If you start a new organization, what might be some of the practices you would include from day one? And the fourth question, and if you feel inspired to transform an existing traditional organization, how might you do and go about it yeah so these would be the questions that need to be answered so there need to be some necessary conditions from the research that has been conducted there are two and only two necessary conditions for organizations to make the leap to teal structures and practices the first one is top leadership so the founder or the top leader must view the world through teal lenses and the second one is ownership owners of the organization and their representatives must also understand and embrace a teal worldview. Experience shows that broad members who don't get it can temporarily give a teal leader free reign when their method delivers outstanding results. But when the organization hits a rough patch or faces a pretty good choice, owners will want to get things under control in the only way that makes sense to them, through top-down hierarchical control mechanisms. This happened at two of the 12 organizations that had been researched here. So these are the two con conditions that are necessary in order to implement a teal style of working. Uh, so the top leadership and the ownership. Geography and cultural background seem not to matter much either. It is true that the 12 companies that were researched have their roots in the West, so Europe and the United States, but several of them have plants and subsidiaries in Asia, Africa or Latin America, and their practices seem to work there just as well. Certain cultures tend to be more different and hierarchical than others, Oh, different and hierarchical than others, but I believe that the longing for self-management and wholeness taps into deep fundamental human yearnings. So that's it. So self-management and wholeness are the ones that we as human beings are searching for, and there's uh, basically no cultural di uh, difference and no boundaries, no no um, borders that... Um, yeah, breaks that down basically, or 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 just simply, um, it those doesn't don't matter if we are uh, looking at self management and wholeness because everybody's looking for that, no matter where we're from. So, starting a teal organization from scratch or transforming an existing organization into teal. So, let's start with it from scratch. So it's easier to start a teal organization from scratch than to transform an existing organization already set in its ways. 
And most likely, it will make your journey more powerful and joyful. But next to everything else going on, it's time to be extra mindful. By default, you are likely to simply reproduce today's management practices. And that's what we need to be careful. Yeah. Um, you must now catch yourself in the act and consciously choose a new, less familiar path. One of the first questions that you should ask yourself, what resonates most deeply with you of the things you've read so far about peer organizations? Or also what resonates most with you from the videos that I've shared with you? So uh, from the recordings, yeah, the, the other parts that I talked about already. One step further, what is it in you, in your history, that vibrates, that excites you as much as it scares you, perhaps, at the prospect of doing this? Some people resonate strongly with self-management because something deep inside them finds it painful that so many people don't get to express their talents in life. Others res resonate with wholeness. Because they long for a place where they can drop the mask and connect with people at a deeper level. Others are so taken by the organization's purpose that they truly want to listen to be of service. If you listen within, what moves you? Another question, if, you, uh, if for a moment you try to take yourself out of the equation and listen to the buying organization, what is the purpose that it wants to serve? What form and shape will best serve its purpose? Let these questions drive what you want to do. So creating a teal organization is not a box ticking exercise where you simply adopt a list of new practices. There are some practices that are foundational. Self-management um, is the way to go and start with people having multiple roles instead of job titles. So here, that's the, one of the key points. Having multiple roles instead of job titles. Here we have the flexibility again. Yeah, uh, here we see uh, hybrid competence. <laughs> Use the advice process and determine a conflict resolution mechanism. So that's what you need to set in place. Yeah, if wholeness is important to you, you need to explore which ground rules you want to establish to create a safe space. Yeah. Um, you also need to choose some soulful meeting practices and you need to determine recruitment and onboarding processes that will help new colleagues join the group. So, and that's all with regards to the purpose. Now ask yourself, what's the minimal amount of planning the project really needs? And what is simply guessing in the dark to have an illusion of control? Can I let go of it so I stay open to signals to new opportunities? That's basically what uh, you need to be aware of and what you need to do when you are starting a teal organization from scratch. So it's a lot about your intuition. If you can trust your intuition, um, then simply go with the flow, yeah? Or um, someone else said that um, uh, she's uh, floating in the along the river. Yeah, let's just let's just float. Don't don't push too hard. Just float. Go with the flow. Now, what happens when you want to transform an existing organization? How can I transform my existing organization? Well, to put it quite frankly, you go figure it out. <laughs> there is no recipe. If you are serious about this, you will find a way. You are smart and resourceful enough to figure it out. You won't get everything right, but a way will open. So if the CEO really wants this, and if the board lets him or her, it will happen. The simplest lesson that we learn from this is that every journey is truly unique. Yeah, so that's basically it. Um, there are need to, there are some things that need to be done if you want to uh, transform an existing organization. So we need to upgrade how we think about change. Yeah. So our dominant mental model for change comes with the hidden assumption that organizations are complicated systems, like an airplane, for example. According to this model, if we are smart in our analysis. 
we can plan a change effort for the next two or even five years. And once we have a smart plan, it simply takes discipline execution. The reality, however, is that organizations are almost always complex systems. That's why so many large change efforts fail. So how can you help a complex system transform? Just think carefully about the first step you want to take and perhaps the second that might follow. And then listen carefully in the spirit of sense and respond. So don't plan everything out, but simply go with the flow and um, uh, have the first step. And then you go step by step, step by step. Yeah. And then you will figure it out what happens. The truth is that our organizations are so complex that however smart we are, we can't predict that what will happen when we introduce even big changes. New unexpected opportunities might open up that we can seize. And certainly some parts of the system will scream because something is out of balance. So let's start with one or two changes that make most sense for now and then listen carefully for the next change the system is calling for. And this is something that is really what I think is legitimate, that is valid in my eyes. Just think about New Year's Eve and all the different New Year's resolutions that we have. Yeah, we want to lose weight, we want to quit smoking, we want to um, uh, answer our friends via WhatsApp more regularly and whatever, whatever pops in your head. When you do too many changes at once, your system will have a collapse and um, it, you, you won't follow through and you need to make small steps. Yeah, one step at a time, small steps, integrate maybe one habit. And once you have implemented that and it's integrated into your everyday life, then you can go on to the next habit. But don't change everything at once. Yeah, If you want to lose weight and you want to go to the gym every day, you want to um, uh, eat healthy every day, uh, you want to have a great routine and a bedtime routine, what do you think your system is going to do? The, the system is going to say, what's going on with you? Uh, I, I'm in shock right now. I don't even know what, what is going on. <laughs> and then you quit. Yeah. So um, too many um, habits will definitely overstrain your system. And um, the same is um, yeah, happening in companies when you want to change them uh, to a teal organization. You cannot simply change everything at once. It doesn't work like that. So this requires a new stance from leaders, a stance that shows confidence and a strong commitment to the journey, as well as willingness to say openly that any pretense of a comprehensive upfront plan would be comforting, but an illusion. And that change is never entirely painless. For a while, things will be out of balance and confusing. And that's the same with Therapy or self-development. If you go to therapy, if you do self-development courses, if you do a coaching, then the first couple of sessions might feel draining. You feel tired. You don't want to get out of bed. You don't, uh, maybe you even feel a little bit of resistance inside of you. You just simply don't want to deal with that. You feel maybe a migraine, a headache, or some other pain somewhere else. That's just simply because your system is working. Yeah, you are working and your body, your mind, and everything um, on the emotional level, spiritual level, physical level, is trying to integrate your new habits. So the first it's the, it's kind of like going to the gym. The first time going to the gym is really the hardest, basically. And then keep going, yeah? So if you only implement small steps, it'll work. And after some time, you've, been, yeah, just simply, uh, you've, yeah, been, you, you, you've gotten used to that. And then it feels normal, yeah? So some people will likely be unhappy about this and criticize you. They want you to protect them from pain and refuse to listen when you say this is beyond anyone's power. And when you are changing to a teal style of management. Careful though. I've seen leaders who've taken this insight too far and responded to any and all criticism with 
Pain is a part of the transformation. This is interesting terrain for leaders. Stay open for valid input while learning to set aside the misguided criticisms that are coming your way. So that is something that you need to keep in mind. The leader, the owner, the CEO, who is only participating sort of like a coach from the outside, needs to be open to criticism still and needs to be open to how much pain is the company able to handle how much pain like challenge or a change pain is the staff willing to uh, encounter and deal with so what's the current level of psychological ownership that's the first question that you have to ask yourself and that's the first thing that you need to find out and here let me tell you you don't have to be the ceo of the company in order to make changes we will get into that in a minute but first, if you want to change anything in your workplace, you need to find out how or what the current level of psychological ownership currently is and what that means we will find out now. How fast or slow should I go? How much risk can we take? The answer, uh, the answer hinges on one critical variable, the level of psychological ownership people feel for their organization. If before the transformation, most colleagues feel strongly about their work and their organization, you can go fast and can take quite a risk. In the midst of the transformation, when there is some confusion or even a bit of chaos, colleagues will rally, will, um, will rally, will self-organize to put new structures in place and save the day. If, on the other hand, employees have little emotional investment in the organization and in its purpose, when work is a burden to be minimized, then don't be surprised if when they are given freedom, they take the freedom but not the responsibility. So there are two ways. Either you have a high, um, uh, a strong feeling towards the company as uh, like the employees, your staff, yeah, your colleagues, and then you can move quickly and uh, implement changes quickly. However, if you feel that they, there is simply no commitment, no loyalty, and uh, the staff is just simply um, yeah, uh, drained by the overall work and don't really, they don't really have the team spirit, the company spirit in them, um, then you need to be slower. And that is something that you can also realize in your personal life. It needs trust. If there is no trust, why do you think that people would move and according to what you're saying? Yeah. So you need to go more slowly, build trust. And that is also something that Byron Katie, a coach and um, therapist, says, if you haven't heard of her, go on, go on YouTube and find videos of her. It, those videos will change your life, I'm telling you. So she said that um, so she went through a, a difficult time in her life and basically her um, was also judging. Yeah, so we tend to judge everybody and everyone all the time. And simply when we take that judgment out, that's how we build trust. And Byron Katie had the same happening with her family, with her children. So she realized, so there wasn't when she, so she went through a change. She felt it. But there's so much that she can share, say and share with her children. I change, I change, I change. However, the children simply didn't trust her because they knew they would be judged if they told, talked to her and told her the truth about what was going on in their lives, for example. But she simply gave it time. And throughout all of the conversations that she had ongoing with her children, she didn't judge anymore. That's what the change was inside of her. And that's when the children realized. So the, in the first couple of minutes, it was like, hmm, that's really weird. And um, obviously, the next couple of encounters, it's not easy to break down those walls. So um, the children were hesitant. But after a while, they realized, oh, mom is not judging us anymore on whatever we are saying. She's very supportive. She's like my best friend. Now I can open up. And that's when Byron realized she had projected also her change towards her children. So she had opened up, not judged anymore, left the judgment out of the conversation, and simply listened. 
totally listened and was there for them. And that's when the children felt safe. That's when they started trusting her again. That's when they started opening up again. Yeah. And that is something that can happen over time. I've realized I've, I've, I've had the same uh, happen to me because I sometimes tell you about my brother, right? And my brother and I, we are very close with one another. He's six years younger than me. And um, when we were younger, though, until the I was 17, we didn't really get along. It was like fighting all the time. It, for the outside world, it looked like we were like, I don't know, like best friends. And obviously when there was somebody um, bothering my brother or bull bullying him, I would definitely stand up for him. And uh, I was proud of him, him and supporting him. But when it was just the two of us alone, we would fight. We would really fight. And it was really difficult. When we are talking about that nowadays, it's just like, it's really strange what happened there. And then um, at the age of 17, I went abroad. As I told you, I went to the United States and did a high school year as an exchange student over there. And when I got back, I realized that my brother was like that. Yeah, he was um, like really uh, distant. He was distant. He was protecting himself because obviously he all he knew was fighting Lisa <laughs> and nothing else. And then... Um, I really there were I remember one situation when he was really getting on my nerves and I was freaking out um and um I I screamed at him again after that and um then but then was something that happened inside of me and then I thought oh no but you didn't want to do that it was not even his fault that he was annoying you it was just the situation so I went to him and talked to him and I said Felix I'm so sorry that I did that and that I was yelling at you I didn't mean it in that way and um it was not your fault it wasn't it was mine and the situation was just overwhelming for me and that's how I felt so I basically shared with him what I said and I apologized and that was the first time in both of our lives that he realized that I apologized to him and that's what was new to him and then I, I realized that he was um always observing me from the side and was just like what's going on with Lisa she's she's a little bit different and then it, it started to he started to open up and it, our relationship got just better and better since and since then we've been best friends <laughs> and uh, just uh, share everything with one another we can trust each other um we don't spend that much time with one another but we don't have to we just we can rely on each other if we need one another's help but that's basically what you need to go through and now think about you and think about yourself. When did you go through a process like that? Have you had a situation like that and you've realized, oh, okay, yeah, it takes trust. But for the other person to develop trust, it takes time and commitment from my side as well. But it's it's not a big deal. It, it, it's not a, a big uh, effort from your side if you are secure and if you are safe and you know what you stand for yeah so if you are then if you are following this teal um mindset it shouldn't be an issue for you to wait yeah because you understand the entire uh, network that is um yeah integrated into this teal organization yeah and without trust it wouldn't work now let's go back to one of these examples in the book uh, Favi, a, an automotive company from France. The way Favi, a traditional hierarchical factory, adopted self-management illustrates this well. So this um, psychological ownership. Yeah. Shortly after Jean-Francois Soubris was hired from the outside as the new CEO, he tried to engage the members of the of his executive team to hand power over to machine operators, but they resisted the idea again and again. Nine months into his role as CEO, he decided to change tactics. It was the last working day of the year, just before the factory would close for the Christmas break. People were cleaning up the factory, the machines already quiet, when he gathered everyone for an improvised address. Standing on top of a few pallets, he shared that the way workers were controlled in the company felt disgraceful for him. So um, he basically says, I've been here with you nine months, nine months that I've seen what you do, that I see people with courage, great professional 
the great professionals who love their work, but whom we prevent from doing good work. I know that people like you don't need carrots and sticks. So, and here's again, which is why I love this book so much, because it doesn't just contain research, but it also contains uh, images, yeah, and pictures. So, so we went on to name a few things that would change. No time clocks anymore. No more salary deductions for coming in late. The stock room would no longer be locked. No more separate dining room for managers and so forth. So we finished by adding, how will we operate in the future? In all honesty, I don't know. I'm convinced that you deserve that we work, to work together differently but I don't have an alternative model. I suggest that together we learn by doing with good intentions, common sense, and in good faith. The factory had a system that incentivized the workers for the number of pieces they machined per hour. That system would be scrapped too, and what people used to make in terms of bonus would simply be added to the base pay. Managers were aghast and complained loudly to Subri after the holidays. It was a recipe for disaster. Productivity would collapse. So he admits he checked the productivity numbers every day for a week, wondering what would happen. It turned out that productivity didn't decrease, but increased. Oh, okay. Bati is here. Okay. Oh, good that I'm talking about um, automotive uh, right now, because you're saying I'm a postgraduate automobile. I am searching for a job in Germany, Europe, or in European countries. Can you help me for a job? Two years experience as a quality and CNC machine operator. And he's from India. Yes, perfectly. Of course, I can help you. You can go to my website and check out my services. I'm, I'm here for you. And um, Clara is here. That was very interesting. Thanks a lot. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, your comment and for your feedback. I appreciate that. I'm glad you like that because I do too. <laughs> okay, now where were we? So, um, yeah, so the number, the productivity didn't decrease; it increased actually. So, what was going on? When you operate a machine, the operators told Sobri there is an optimal rhythm that is psychologically the least tiring for the body. In the old system, with the hourly targets, they had always intentionally slowed down. They gave themselves some slack in case management increased their targets. So that's basically what happens. And that's what I hear all the time everywhere. It's that um, people slow down on purpose so that they prepare for the increase that the management will send them. So the management will at some point send them an increased amount of, of uh, pieces they have to produce or whatever they have to do. And for that, they are slowing down intentionally. They gave themselves some slack in case management increased their targets. For years, operators had effectively worked at a rhythm that was more tiring for them and less profitable for the company. Crazy, huh? From the moment um, Sobri was appointed CEO, he walked the shop floor and spoke with the operators every day. Nine months later, he knew what they felt strongly about, uh, that they felt strongly about the factory, and he had sensed that they trusted and respected him. So here we see that um, this is actually um, very helpful um, to find out the psychological ownership. And here he sees they feel strongly about the company, they uh, have trust in him, and that's why he can move quickly, yeah. Um, okay, so many ways, no, no. So the importance of trust before making big changes is very important. It would often take a year, sometimes two, for frontline workers to sense that something was different about their new leadership and become invested in where the plant was going. Only then would bigger changes, like the advice process, be introduced. Many ways to start. So where do we start? There are different ways, and I'm explaining these different ways now. So many organizations choose to experiment and test new methods within one unit to learn and build excitement. And maybe that is something that you've seen before in your company, because that's what happens. They have either a completely new change uh, a department that is where they are testing things, 
or um, in even a smaller team within the department. Yeah. The next question then comes, um, which unit? So there are many criteria can be relevant to choosing a good candidate. I believe the most important one might simply be which one has the most energy, which unit has a leader who is raring to get started. So who is willing to do that teal change? Who is interested and um, most ambitious about that change? Yeah. In another version would be, so there are four different ways on how to start the second version. Instead of transforming the existing organizations, they have built a separate small Birdsock inspired unit next to it. Nurses are allowed to jump ship and the idea is for the new unit to grow while the old one dies out. So that's basically for the competitors of Birdsock, the nurses company from the Netherlands. Number three, some organizations choose to encourage experiments throughout the organization. Um, so there, for example, can be an event that marks the launch of the transformation and in no time enthusiasts from all over the world register. At the event, the CEO shared his vision and then encouraged everyone to experiment, to do a bit of mischief, question how things are done and to push the boundaries. The hope is to kickstart the transformation with lots of parallel experimentation and to generalize the best solutions that are blah. blah. Yeah, so basically different experiments in one company, but um, um uh they pick then the best that that worked out the best yeah or maybe a mixture of everything and the fourth approach another approach is to introduce or upgrade a certain practice for the entire organization at once for instance to adopt a new meeting practice to invite wholeness or to implement the advice process throughout the organization or to change the budgeting process the best way is to have these new processes designed by a voluntary task force. Yeah, because the voluntary task force is the one that is um, um, that is the most ambitious about that. Yeah, and Pekas here, hello. So, and you could do that with open space or appreciative inquiry. Uh, the more people are involved in the design, the more easily everyone will adopt the new practices. Yeah, so the four approaches outlined can be mixed, of course. So and now what happens next is you need to follow the energy. So listen and sense and respond. The first is for the CEO to listen to her or his personal aspiration. Deep inside, what are you yearning for? What change would be profoundly meaningful to you? Is it more in the field of self-management, of wholeness, or of evolutionary purpose? When you clarify this, some of the first steps might become obvious, yeah? Because that's then how you find out how to start. And second, listen to the organization. The key question here is, for which change is there most energy? Where is energy currently blocked or waiting to be set free? So that's that's basically how you start. And then there is another important aspect. It's the importance of self-correction. So for all but the most intolerable risks, let's not try and prevent things going wrong up front, but wonder instead how quickly will a problem be detected and will someone step up to correct it? So it's not to plan ahead massively, to make sure that we avoid all of the risks. No, it's just to simply have mechanisms in place or processes in place that more easily detect the risks and the mistakes that maybe have been done and then have someone um, willing um, and motivated to, to, to step up to correct that mistake, okay? So now, how will the colleagues react and adapt? Mm, that could be difficult. Some people might prefer to take a management position in another company and they can be supported financially in that transition. So if you feel then there, this is just not right for you, the company is changing into a, into a management style that you just simply don't feel comfortable with, then you always have the opportunity to leave. And that is the first step. You need to find out for yourself personally, individually, who you, who you are, you, you as unique as you are, you wonderful and beautiful miracle 
anywhere around the globe. It is you who needs to decide what is right or wrong for you. That is also something that you need to think about when it comes to company culture. Do you relate to that company culture or not? If you don't comply with what the company is living, you don't have to apply in the first place. Yeah, you can scrap that. It doesn't make sense. Um, but um, that's the first thing that you need to do. Listen to your own desires and then you can move forward. Then you can think about the organization, okay? Because if you don't know what you want and why you feel weird in that process, how is your co colleague going to help you? How is your, your coach going to help you if you don't know where you're heading to, what your ideal is, yeah? But for that, obviously, you can also have a coach to find that out because that's actually one of the first steps that I'm doing in my job coaching um, to find out and define what the ideal job looks like, yeah? And it's not just about the job title or the roles that this person wants to do, but also, do you want to work in an office? Do you want to work from home? Do you want to work from a coffee shop? Do you like plants? Do you like a big office space where you can uh, chat with your colleagues or not? Do you like phone calls, emails, and so on? So all of these things need to be discussed, need to be thought about because that's nothing that we learn in school. It's nothing that we learn at our job place. We normally finish school, finish university, and are happy that we got a job, but it's later on when we realize we need to redefine how we're working and think about what makes you happy, what makes you whole, what fulfills you. Managers who stay often experience phantom pain at first. The old way to exert power is no longer there. They must learn new ways to make things happen. But quite consistently, those who stay report after some time how liberating it is to no longer have the pressure of bosses to please and subordinates to motivate and keep in line. They can finally go back to doing creative work. So that is really relaxing. That's really comforting to know that this is possible, right? Then obviously you always need to know yourself. If you are a person that likes power and then your power is taken away, then obviously go find a therapist. <laughs> That's my advice. Now, what's the role of the CEO? Because obviously in Teal, we say the CEO is not so much the leader who gives the orders. It's rather um, yeah, like a coach at your side. So the, the CEO has not just one role, but many roles. Many of the traditional roles of the CEO fall away. There are, for example, no targets set, no budgets to approve, no executive team to chair, no promotions to decide on. There are two traditional roles that CEOs often retain. The one is to be the public face of the organization to the outside world because clients, vendors, and regulators often expect to be able to talk with the big boss. The CEO can play this role inside too, for instance, participating in the onboarding process with all new joiners to share with them some of the organization's history, values, and purpose. And another one is to be a sensor of where the organization wants to go. Of course, everyone in the organization is invited to be a center, but in many cases, people in the organization recognize the founders or CEO's ability to sense and articulate where the journey is going with particular clarity and are happy for the CEO to play that role. A new role, and that's the most important role of the CEO in a teal organization, is to hold the space, holding the space. And that is simply what coaches do as well. Me as a coach, me as a job coach for you guys, I hold the space for you to find out what it is that you want. To hold the space if limiting beliefs are coming up, if you have feelings that um, make you, then um, that's what I'm here for. That's what coaches are here for, holding the space so that you can feel all the feels, that you can have all the thoughts and talk about them. That's also what a therapist does for you. They hold the space. Holding space for teal structures and practices. That is important. Whenever a problem comes up, someone somewhere will call for tried and proved solutions. 
The calls can come from different corners. One time it's a board member who will call for more control. Another time a colleague or a client. Over and over again, the CEO must ensure that the new practices are reaffirmed and that traditional management methods don't creep in through the back door. So that's what holding space for the CEO also means. Okay. Okay. So if you are not the CEO, what can you do? As a middle or a senior manager, you can champion changes that make sense from an orange perspective and that your top management can embrace, say, more agile, client-facing units. At a local level, there is more you can do than you might suspect. Within your area, for the people working below you, many more, more possibilities open up. For instance, take all the practices related to wholeness. If you bring them in wisely and by invitation, of course, no one can be, can be forced into wholeness, they will probably fly below the radar screen of leaders at the very top. Executives there might hear about it and find it a bit strange, but if it makes people happy and keeps them motivated, what is there to say? Yeah, and maybe then they hear about that. Oh, did you hear what uh, is happening in Department X, Y, Z? We need to do that as well. A middle manager um, that the author once met also called it opening the shit umbrella. Sorry for the language, but it's written here. You participate in the practices that come from higher up the hierarchy, but you don't cascade them down. And I have a very um, close person um, who is doing that. Yeah, so she has been um, working uh, like that uh, for many years simply because that's the way how she works. Uh, and it was nothing that was forced onto her, but she just realized, okay, there is no point in me um, like tra uh, transporting the pressure that comes from above to the people that are below me. It's rather that let's put, uh, let's open the umbrella and um, let the shit show happen outside. How long will you stay and what risks are you willing to take? Those are the questions that you need to ask yourself when your company is transforming to a teal organization. There are two questions that you are invited to ask yourself. How long will you realistically stay in your current position? If you believe that in a year or two you might move elsewhere, it's probably not wise to go too radical. Unless your successor happens to be a pioneer like you, he's likely to return to business as usual and people on your teams might feel cheated. And um, the, are you willing to stay for, say, five years in that position? Would you be willing to forego a promotion that might come your way. That's basically something that you need to ask yourself. The second question has to do with the risk you're willing to take. Listen inside and ask yourself, are you willing, if it comes to it, to be branded as someone who colors very much outside the lines? Are you willing, possibly, to lose your job over this? It's possible, yeah? It could happen. That's basically what you need to be aware of. There is a simpler way. At some point, there are two different ways to talk about all of this, all of this that I mentioned in the book. One story is that Teal is cutting edge stuff that few people really understand. Um, uh, yeah, and few people really understand it, that transforming the organization will be risky and require lots of time and energy. This is the story that most of us intuitively go for. And then there is a whole other way to look at it. The tier practices are the simpler, more intuitive, more natural way to do things that most of us long to work in natural hierarchies, long for communities where we can bring in our whole self, long for a purpose that gives guidance and meaning. So basically it's up to you how you want to communicate this. And this is just the beginning. These are extraordinary times to be alive, often confusing but full of possibilities. It is up to us to invent a new path. There is an old saying, sometimes attributed to Native American tribes, that seems particularly relevant to the author as we embark on this shift to more life-giving organizations. We are the people we have been waiting for. 
And I think we cannot close this book um, any better. Uh, we are the people we've been waiting for. Yeah, I think this saying is really, really good. It's um, It makes sense to me because if you want change, it's up to you. You can change it now. Yeah, do it now. What are you waiting for? What do you want the future of work to look like? How do you visualize new work? How do you visualize yourself in the future? How do you want to work? What changes do you need in order to feel fulfilled at your workplace, in your work life? Now is the time to think about that and implement changes. I wish you a wonderful day. And thank you very much for all of the comments and people that joined me here. And I'll see you again very soon. Have a wonderful afternoon and bye-bye.